Hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, SJ. You're coming through very clearly. All right, thank you for coming. Uh, Steve, Jim Mangolis, and our family, Sangwook, uh, uh, and many uh, distinguished faculties, really thank you for coming and uh, you know, encouraging us. Uh, all right, uh, today's cases, we prepare to uh, let me in. Um, Okay, this is first case, and so yes. Dr. Gang and Dr. Bach, uh, our colleagues, and so would you introduce that first? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, the patient is a 74-year-old male, admitted for a forty angina. He ended PCI at proof circumflex due to non stemi before three months ago from other hospital, and if uh, visited our hospital because of the sustained forty angina and coronary angiogram showed triple vessel disease, and. There was severe RCA diffuse disease and we treated three weeks ago. Next. The patient is a current smoker and has a history of a hypertension. Next. Mm -hmm. And echocardiography showed normal LV systole function with mild aortic stenosis. And the left coronary angiogram showed intermediate stenosis, distal left main, and we measured FFR. And the, there was a subtotal occlusion FR distal circumflex, and the proximal circumflex 10 was patent. And the right coronary angiogram showed diffuse severe stenosis. Next. This is the FFR of the LAD to left main pullback. Okay. You can see. Exactly. Yes, yeah, next. And we treated RCA. Mm -hmm. Next. Yes. Great. And so would you show us uh, this? OK, good. All right. I think this is very interesting, typical FFR. you know, uh, angiographically intermediate stenosis. And uh, to be honest, patient had a you know classic uh, F4 to chest pain, and so we gonna expect the patient clearly have uh, some you know uh, angina, and so we did FFR is 0.75 is very class criteria is you know positive ischemia. Yes. So, all right, so uh, all right, just uh, angel would be okay, and would you? This is ario caudal view, shallow ario, uh, AP caudal AP caudal view. What do you think? There's uh, not too much disease on the remain. Anyway, there's some hazardness on there, right? However, for the spider view, <coughs> another view, <coughs> this is spider view. O could you show us a previous one? Okay, this one. Is it a little bit different? Uh, maybe uh, AP cranial view, shallow area, yes. right? <coughs> Clearly, uh, we can see that some disease, diffuse disease, and Distal part of the body may sh <coughs> sharp had some, uh, you know, stenosis around you know, 50 to 6 percent, and then the, pre and the, the next view. All right, this is a spider view. I show that the, maybe the ostial part of the main by angiographic finding there may be some disease or not. However, we cannot, you know, discriminate that one. So <coughs> clearly, our patient had a. Uh, symptoms and positive FFR, and so we prepare these cases. Would you? Uh, okay, discuss about that one. <coughs> Steve? Uh, All right, so we, consecutively we're going to show the obvious finding, then, then we're going to discuss, right? And so would you show us uh, uh, obvious from the LAD? LAD? Yes. Okay, LAD, why not? Do you want to This is the obvious pullback <coughs> from proximal <coughs> LAD. You can see that LAD has a mild disease, and the vessel size is 4.0, uh, and there uh, is the small, very high diagonal branch, and circumflex is coming from one o'clock. And after that, at the just distal main, you can see the very heavy eccentric plaque, and the vessel size is about 4.5, and proximally, proximal shaped left main, there is a diffuse plaque. So, and this is the very proximal of the left main, and the plaque disappears. So you can see that just ostium of the left main is relatively preserved All without right. plaque. I was for circumflex. Yes. And can you show the ibus for circumflex? We also checked the ibus for circumflex, mm -hmm. and the stent of the proximal circumflex was patent. And here is just the ostium of the circumflex. And you can see the ostium of the circumflex is clear. Yeah. And here, yes, 
osteum of the circumflex is clear, well preserved, and when coming into the left main, there is the eccentric pra. And we also check the diagonal branch. Can you please show the diagonal branch osteum? Here's the diagonal branch, a relatively small branch of size of the 2.5 or 2.75, and this is osteum. Also, diagonal osteum is well preserved, but there is some angle issue, so we, we protect, we decide to protect the diagonal branch with wiring. All right, so what, uh, what is the message from the IVUS findings? Oh, yes, <coughs> in IVUS, uh, when we check the IVUS, uh, in fact, we are very surprised and shocked because the in angiography, it, the disease does not look so severe. But in IVUS, the left main disease was so tight, and the minimal lumen area of the left main was just 4.3. Would you measure that? Yes. Okay. Minimal lateralist portion of yes. uh, main, you know, uh, yes. minimal lumen area, 4.3 millimeter scale or something. And very important is, you know, findings yes. in circumflex osteum is a big, yes. however, the absolute free of disease. Yes. Downward branch osteum is absolutely free of disease, yes. right? So, uh, by uh, uh, compare with the angel, would you show us angel? All right, angiographic findings in spite of you. And <clears throat> we cannot discriminate uh, what, the, you know, exactly the digital portion is. Uh, however, by arms findings, we have a clear idea. Yes. Big diagonal circumflex osteum is good, and mainly the disease confined to the distal limb main, yes. right? So, all right, so we got angiographic findings and arms findings, and so would you uh, discuss about this, uh, how to you know, treat for this patient? So, SJ, I think it's a wonderful example of uh, use of physiology when the angiogram was not all that clear and use of IVUS to clarify uh, the local anatomy, particularly the freedom from uh, involvement of the circumflex. So we've got a wonderful group of colleagues at the, at the uh, podium here. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to pitch in. But how are you thinking about uh, treating? You can cross over and avoid the circumflex, but you've got a high diagonal branch to worry about. So what are your technical thoughts? Well. I, don't, I, I wouldn't necessarily worry about the diagonal. If it needs something later, I can do that. But clearly, you have to put a wire down the LAD and a wire down the circumflex. And um, I would treat the, um, the lesion in the direction of the circumflex. Um, I want to tell the audience, you can put, if you have questions or um, comments, you can use your mobile phone to, uh, with the TCT uh, AP app, and uh, we'll answer them as we go along. I think this is a, a great example of showing the discrepancy between the angiogram and the IVUS. Well, physiologically, it's significant, but really from the NGO, it doesn't look that bad. But then the IVUS really tells us what's inside. Uh, I think this is a true 100 lesion, but uh, uh, because of the proximity of these branches, I think personally I would probably stand from the LAD into left main, uh, crossing the circumflex ostium. But I think the circumflex ostium is free of disease. I think one stand should be enough. Okay. All right. Uh, actually, second case is a little bit tough. Oh, yes. So uh, I, wanna, I would like to save the time for that. And just um, Dr. Kao, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I suggested a totally uh, different, you know, uh, insight from yeah. the Hobbes findings is we want to do a single stand crossover yeah. from the LAD to the left vein. And we, all right, the technical point of view is that there are, you know, many, uh, we consider about the protection wires for that. Uh, however, in spite of you, uh, the osteo circumflex is fully over the edge. The angle is quite enough. It's more than, uh, I think it's almost a 90 degree something. However, in case of a big diagonal branch, it's very narrow, you know, angle. Yes. So with the main branch is at 80. And so uh, in practical concerns, uh, personally, I think we don't need a protection of a circumflex system. It's just a two wire, yes. uh, LED and diagonal branch, and do uh, stand. So, all right, so we prepare the another view. There's, there's uh, I want to take a picture first uh, to show you all and injection. 
All right, I think it'll be better to wear. So, I uh, will try the uh, three five. Yes. And uh, Sierra, uh, with uh, what is the length of stand? Twenty three. Twenty three. Yes. And uh, I, I think it's enough uh, stand length uh, measured by Arvis. All right, there are some difficulties. However, I think I want to do a. Uh, direct stand here. Test, please. Test. Okay, two, two. Okay, test, please. Test. All right. Maybe, to be honest, by arms finding the osteum of the lip LED was almost clear. free of disease, yes. right? It's one zero zero. So I want to uh, test, please. I want to cover more than main part here and the pull the stand out. Test, please. Uh, I think it's quite enough to uh, normal looking or still part of the main here. Test, please. Okay, what do you think? Uh, Spot up, please. Uh, exactly the same. Okay, I will try that one. Okay, test, please. All right, we have, you know, you know covered holder. Yes. Uh, okay, test again. I want to show. So I will just show us again at the previous one. <coughs> I, I think it's more comfortable. All right. Uh, test. Okay, I think it's enough. Okay, test please. One more. Okay, inflate. Inflate. Twelve. Sj, as you're inflating, can you comment on what stents you think are best for left main? Are are there? Particular characteristics of stents or stents that you like for left main as opposed to other stents? Uh, no, I, actually, <laughs> I don't believe you know uh, stent difference in terms of, uh, especially for the main PCI concerns. Uh, we compare uh, many uh, randomized studies, uh, registry data, compare it side by side. In case of a second generation drill to stent, I think there's no difference at all. Yes. The main is, main is, to be honest, okay, inflate. <laughs> 14. What is nominal? 12. 12. 12. 13. 14. 14. 16. 16. What is final? 3.7. 3.7. A final stand expansion. Yes. So using the delivery balloon. All right. Uh, actually, the approximate LED is 3.75, uh, yes. 75 something, yes. and yes. more than 4. Yes. So we have to consider kind of a you know discrepancy in size wise. The proximate LED is relatively small and large, you know, the main, and so the reason why I choose the Sierra, uh, there's the, I don't know, how will they, you know, explain the, uh, in terms of uh, size, dis discrepancy match yes. concern, they use the 3.5, we, we're going to choose the 3.5 Sierra, can make a 5.5 yes, something, 5 .5. Oh, right. very yeah. big, yes. you know, uh, they can dilate. Uh, so, Anyway, I can choose the, uh, however, if effective concern, efficacy concern, I don't believe any uh, difference. Even in the first generation of the rule, things in Cypher versus Texas, no difference at all. So, or whatever you want. Uh, however, uh, we're going to do harvest, no, just to do the full yes. balloon, no oh. compliance. That's okay. After uh, high press inflation, we're going to see the harvest. And so, there are some. You know, you can expect some malopposition, something like that. However, you're going to do a uh, 4-0 non-compliant balloon. And then we have a clear idea in terms of a pre-PCI by obvious. And so, well, all uh, right. SJ. It's getting, getting more difficult to SJ. <laughs> find out. Yep. SJ, may I ask you a question? Maybe irrelevant. But uh, your uh, 0.75 FFR was taken before the treatment of RCA or after? after. And it was after, after treating right. RCA. After, right. Okay, so you, think, you also think that uh, the FFR, if taken before the uh, RCA treatment, would be different, probably even lower? Uh, all right. The before, before you, that, that means the before treatment of RCA is... Uh, oh, we measured the FFR after treating RCA, and oh, right, RCA right. was not CTO, it was just severe right, right, disease. Right, right, yes. so we didn't check the before. Uh, all right, so I want to use the 4.0, 
non component blue here and maybe proximal part of LED as a normal looking area yes. so I don't need a, you know too much high pressure for that all right 네, 다 됐습니다. 잠깐만요. 오케이. Okay. Dr. Ba, you don't want Inflate. to remove the diagonal wire before high pressure? All right, right. Read it. Okay. So we're going to see the, uh, uh, what happens. Uh, test. Test. Okay, clear. Uh, uh, would you show us a spider view? view? I would like to check the how much, how much compromise in terms of uh, circumference of sodium and diagonal branch too. Okay, injection. I think it's good, right? Okay. Uh, there are some later loosened by uh, Stan Stewart, so we don't need that one. Okay, good suggestion. Test, please. Test two. All right, here we are. Okay, inflate. Inflate. What is the nominal? 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 16. 16. 4.05. Okay, deflate. Deflate. All right. 조금 아프죠? 다 됐어요. 이제 test please. Test. It's a kind of a, you know very proximal part of a, including the you know side branch here. Te test please. Test. It kind of a part. Okay, here. Inflate. Inflate. 14. Just on the polygon of a confluent POC area. So why not? 14. 16. 14, 16. Yeah. Almost. What about the 20? 20. What side? 4.1. Okay. Deflate. Deflate. Uh, for all balloon using the 20 atmosphere. And okay, we're gonna see the angel finding first. Full shot. Okay. I think it's good. Uh, what I want the. Uh, and uh, this moment we're gonna check uh, our force, and then we're gonna decide is more, you know, part more, uh, you know, optimization concern. Would you, would you give me Arbus? Would you show us Angel finding? Angel. Spot of you. Okay, good, perfect. Any comment on that? Looks great. Uh, you don't want to check uh, FFR for the diagonal? No. No. <laughs> no. Even if a positive, I don't like to see the positive FFR. And uh, second one is, you know, TV3 floor. Anyway, it's almost matched with a negative FFR. It's small, not too big. All right, here we are. Just the distal part of the uh, stand. Yes. Dr. Gang, you can see. Yes, this is the, the just this part of the stand. We implanted 3.5 stand um. up to uh, 3.7 and then inflate uh, with the 4.0 with low pressure. You can landing see the good, yeah, right? landing is very good. Good uh, position and fully expanded. And proximal LED, and you can see the diagonal branch and circumflex at 1 o'clock. And here, the most digits. This is uh, side, yeah, it's well expanded, and but there remained a little eccentricity, and here is the proximal left main, and the stand is well expanded, and I think we can inflate more with a more high pressure with the 4.0 balloon, and here the proximal landing zone, it's good, it's good, yes, well expanded, well opposed. Well, one or two segment of uh, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, yes. some uh, mile of position over there. Mm -hmm. However, overall, uh -huh. stand expansion is good. Stand area is exactly, the stand diameter is four millimeters, yes. and the uh, stand uh, you know, area is, what do you think, so more than 12 millimeters yes. scale. It's almost, uh, you're gonna expect, you know, uh, less than 2% uh, here late. Yes, almost that's right. <laughs> okay, so, uh, what do you think? Uh, any more uh, high pressure or just a little bit or low? What do you think from the panel? Who wants to weigh in? <laughs> Leave it alone? I think, I think that's enough. <laughs> Next case. <laughs> All right, I think you made that look very easy, SJ.
Um, Steve, can I ask you a question? Um, do you think some sort of debulking device would be worthwhile here, a cutting balloon or something before, before no. the inflation? No. Uh, for us, we don't have data, and I don't believe, in a, especially in the big vessels, you know, the uh, effective stand area is the most important factor, and so we can make a, all right, big. All right, uh, there are, to be honest, by our findings, one or two, you know, should yes. have some very much proximal part. However, overall, stand expansion is good. We yes. did already for all high pressure, 20 atmosphere. Yes, 20 atmosphere. All right, so. Uh, I'm very, you know, happy. <laughs> so, all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any comment yeah. on that? Do yeah. move a second? Great. It's more yeah. tough one, right? So you're going to discuss this in more detail. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move to the second cast rep, Dr. An. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Park. Good morning. Yes. I'd like to introduce my team. It's a Professor Lee, the previous my our fellow, but working for. <laughs> <laughs> become the professor at other hospital and my fellow Dr. Zhou we join our team so Dr. Lee could you introduce our first case yes uh, this case is a 64 year old female uh, he she uh, has a effort chest pain her coronary risk factors was uh, uh, hyperlipidemia she underwent <coughs> PCA at Prox LAD one year ago and mid LAD three months ago Coronary angiogram showed the significant ISR at the proximal LAD and the significant stenosis at the depth main. Next. Yeah. Clinical presentation was uh, stable angina. Next. Yeah. Echocardiography showed the normal LV systolic function. And we checked the FFR. FFR value was uh, zero, uh, LAD FFR was 0 0.73. Next. Okay. RCA is uh, good. RCA is uh, good. So could you yeah. show us uh, the coronary angiogram? This is an uh, AP quadrant view. Today is a coronary angiogram. The long left main and looks a significant disease there left to main. And next, please. Yes, the. the uh, uh, the stent was uh, implanted at the other hospital the, based on the medical record. Uh, they implanted a 2.5 stent. Yeah. What is the length? Yes. What is the length? Length? Tw 28 something. Yeah. Uh, 18. 22, 18. Uh, two, two, st two stent. 18 and 22. Yes. 2.5 at and mid LAD. Basically, 2.5 at Fox LAD is too small. Mm. And can you see the uh, stand? Looks very underexpanded. And can you see it? Long edge. Next, please. The circle's tube is very tight. Next. So I tried to see the eyeballs, but the eyeballs cannot pass things through. Oh. So do you have any comment and, and question on patient history and current angiogram? Anybody on the panel? What are you going to do with this case? I have a comment. Um, there's, a, there's a big hunk of calcium extrinsic to the, um, to the artery. And if you do, when you do IVUS, you may or may not see so much calcium in the artery, but that, that um, hunk of calcium on top is keeping you from fully expanding your stent. And um, that should have been taken care of before they put the stent in. Yeah. I think, I think that the calcium is continuous to the left main all the way, and it's very eccentric. So I think uh, the first treatment probably, like, James, uh, Jim said, should uh, more arterial ablative procedure should be done before the stand deployment. Mm -hmm. the, stand is the stand is probably too, too small, too five. Yeah. So I see Tony Colombo in the audience. Uh, Tony, do you have a comment here? You, you've had some experience with this. You have a... Uh... 
They are problems that uh, you confronted with the stent which was placed uh, with inadequate lesion preparation. Uh, so uh, we know that you can go with a high pressure balloon. It may help, but not always. I think this is a very nice uh, situation, even if it's off label, for shock wave. Because uh, uh, the other possibility is not very elegant, but uh, most of the time it works uh, also to do rotational aterectomy, rotablator. Uh, it's not elegant at all to do rotablator inside the stent, but uh, I must say that it works. Uh, so I think uh, uh, the first, uh, it, you always try to be simple, to go to a, a high pressure balloon. It may work if appropriately sized, 3.5. And if you do IVUS, you may even go to 4 But I will only go with 4 if I have IVUS that confirms. And if the high pressure balloon doesn't work, you can even try high pressure cutting balloon. And uh, if you have shock wave, of course, the most elegant will be shock wave if uh, you have uh, calcification and not fibrosis. If you have fibrosis, uh, then it becomes more difficult because shock wave doesn't work. So I think. Uh, we have a series of, uh, of alternatives. Uh, that's why I called on you, Tony. Uh, this procedure, which I call laser lithotripsy, <laughs> is taking an eczema laser, a small catheter, not a large catheter, and... And what? Yeah, I understand that, but um, the, um, the procedure is quite, um, quite uh, heathen, but it, it works very well. You, you, if you stay inside the stent with your laser catheter and, and it, uh, use maximum uh, fluence and maximum rate, um, you can actually bust up that calcium on the outside. And when it, are you are you waving? And also with the contrast injection while applying the laser at the same time. Yeah. 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 But and, uh, uh, unfortunately, in Korea, the laser and uh, lithotripsy devices are not, are not available now. So we only have the rotaborator. So my initial plan was uh, 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 try the high pressure balloon, the 2.5, and try to up to very high pressure, 28, 30, and it doesn't work. And then I, I will tr I would try to rotaborate. Mm -hmm. So this is a 2.25 high pressure balloon. Fortunately, high pressure balloon is very expanded. Next, this is 2.5 consecutively. And next, to see the IVUS, IVUS backup is not good. So the in, using the guide, uh, guide, guide, guide chiller. So I insert the IVUS. Could you show us the IVUS? This is the distal portion of here is distal edge. Stain is just 2.5. Can you see the IVUS? Yes. yes. It's 3 o vessel, some, actually. Yeah, more, yes, more than 3 o, at least 3 o vessel. So that's why the IVUS is very important to make a good stain expansion particularly in this kind of very complicated situation. Yes. So that range is coming from the 12 o'clock. And vessel is more than 3.0. So definitely 2.5 stand is too small. You can see the some malaposis portion at 11 o'clock and 9 o'clock. Superficial calcification, stain is not well opposed to the uh, vessel wall. Here is a very calcified lesion. Here, the vessel size is more than 3.5. You can see the malaposis throat and 7 o'clock. Sug is coming from the 5 o'clock. Yeah, this is a sulk. This is this left main, very tight. Left main size is uh, almost 4.0. Very long left main. 
superficial calcification at uh, 7 o'clock. Left main vessel size is more than 5.40. Lumen here is good. So based on the IVUS, so next please. Next please, next. So I, I'd like to apply one more, the 3.0 3 high pressure balloon. And make a good position of LED stand. I will try to the circumflex wire insertion to the circumflex. This is a 3O high pressure balloon. Yep. We already know that uh, this is the reference vessel 3O. 14, 16. 14, 16. Deflation. 18. 18. Deflation. 20. 18, 20, 24, 24, 24, depletion, 24, 28, 24, 28, 28 is 3.25, take time, depletion, depletion, 20, Go ahead. Twenty. Deflation. Antonio, you have a comment? So I would put a, a wire in the circumflex before doing these very high pressure inflations because it's already tight. And after you optimize the LED and the left main, you make more difficulties to go. So you have to put the wire anyway. So why don't you do it? Uh, Test it earlier. Yeah, I thought you were going to put a wire in the circumflex. You mentioned that the angle into the circumflex is not particularly favorable. And if the, if the vessel went down, you'd have a hard time salvaging it. OK, please give me the wire. Yes, I fully agree with Antonio's opini opinion. But I, previously, I tried to the wire to the circumflex and not easy. So because mm. I, I thought that the, the not fully expanded the stand, so stand throat is very dense, so circ wire is not easy to insert. Yeah, he tried, but it was difficult. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to get any easier. Yeah. The LED stand is covered the circle's team. Yeah. Two millimeters. I think uh, from this case, we have to learn a lesson that uh, 2.5 size is always smaller for, always very small for the proximal LED. Yeah. Yes. Test, please. Test it. Test it. Test it. We also had some experience that in case, you know, uh, when, when the high pressure balloon is not able to fully open the dense calcium, we can also try to use the OPM balloon, which can inflate up to 40 atmosphere. And sometimes, especially in stand, very severe stenosis, it might be a very good situation to open up the calcified and also under expand the stand. But if you're going to do that, you need to use a smaller balloon. You cannot use your maximum size. What, what wire are you trying to use to get into the circumflex? This is the BMW wire. BMW. Test. Test it. If I failed, I'd like to change it to other wire, more floppy thing. Or you can use a dual lumen catheter. Yeah, right.
Does the spider view not, not help you a bit more than this view? Yes, I'll, after I try this view, I will change it to the spider view. Test, please. Test, please. Dr. Margolis was mentioning the hairpin technique here to, uh, to get into the circumflex if you need it. I didn't know that's what it was called. Test, please. Test. So in a catheter, uh, we always use double lumen catheter like a crusade in this kind of situation because um, uh, the one uh, is that the, the angle uh, from left main to circumflex is quite uh, and strong. So. Maybe you can try a reverse wire technique. Using double open caster and try reverse wire. Well, while Dr. An is wiring, let, let's have a little discussion. Uh, in, in terms of the imaging tool, of course, IVERS is very practical. But in this kind of deep calcification, do you think I, uh, OCT will also help to actually identify the whole depth of that calcium? Who wants to deal with that question? So I, there's a lot of calcium in the left main. You're asking whether OCT or because with the, with the IVAS we can only see superficial because behind it right, is all right. shadow. Right, you can't tell the depth of and, the calcium. And, yeah, if you want to really fracture the whole depth of the calcium, you need to see Double through. Double to touch his hair. Crusader, crusader, please. That said, I think they have only limited tools. They have rotational atherectomy. They don't have laser or shock waves, so maybe it's not mm -hmm. relevant. I mean, it's yeah. an interesting question, theoretically, yeah. Yeah. but they only have one yeah. tool. That's right. I'm a big fan of IVIS, but um, one look at the fluoroscopy tells you what the story is. Mm. That's a rock outside the, um, mm. the left main. So, Gaia 1, please. Yeah. So I think there's sort of two technical issues in wiring this. One is getting the wire into the lesion itself, and the other is allowing the wire to cross down into the vessel. So I, I think I heard you say you were going to use a Gaia 1, which would potentially deal with the first question. I must say I have a little concern that the guy one might not follow once you get into the vessel. Comments from the, yeah. from the podium? Test, so Doctor, you are using yeah. Gaia one mm -hmm. because it's a very controllable wire. I need more call. If I fail to insert the wire, then I like to put the stain to the left main first, not overlap to the previous stain, and then try again the rewire. You know, this um, 
this patient's going to get together, get better for um, maybe two weeks or a month. And um, personally, this might be a time to stop this case and send her somewhere where she can get fixed. I know that this is Test. this is per perhaps the best cath lab in the whole world, but even the best cath lab doesn't always have what you need to do this this case. Sean, what, what, what wire would you use here? Do you have thoughts about the, the, the best approach? Well, I, I think personally I would, of course, use a double lumen catheter. And I would not go for a Gaia because Gaia, I think you're right. Maybe you can get the tip inside, but then you cannot follow through. So personally, I would probably go for a, uh, something like an uh, Ultimate 3 gram, which is a hydrophilic one. Uh, with a very good uh, controllability, uh, or the other possibilities could be um, the uh, XTR, which is also slippery, and maybe uh, can find this tiny entry of the circumflex and then follow through. But then I think it's, it's all about the bend of the tip and control of the wire. I think you're going to need some hydrophilicity to make the turn once you get in, into, yes. the, into the vessel itself. Yes. tip of the wire in the circumflex and then partially double up the wire in the LED, you can push and pull and that will advance the hydrophilic wire. I need more core. The, uh, the podium has been a little quiet in terms of offering suggestions here. <laughs> this is a tough <laughs> case. Are there other thoughts about uh, how to wire this? Yeah, well, you know, to encounter this kind of complicated situation, of course, double lumen capital like this is helpful. Uh, you know, the choice of guy wire we have discussed, you know, uh, the, the, the band and the curve. The other option, in case that still be difficult, we can also try to use uh, another, you know, micro capital like the super course where they have the curve like 45, 90 degree. Sometimes it might help to navigate with the initial difficulties of the retrofest origin. And with that, when they can engage into the right orifice, when you turn the catheter at the, at the right direction, it helps. Then perhaps um, navigating with the guide wire will become easier as well. Test, please. Has anybody tried to use the question and answer, or the, qu the question and comment uh, system with your mobile phone? Can somebody please try it and let's make sure it works? I would do this myself, but I'm too old to use the damn thing. <laughs> I think Dr. An always get the more difficult case. <laughs> there it goes. Huh. Here you go. Test two. Yeah. Test oh, no. Maybe. No. No. Okay. Test two. Yep. 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 Well, what is the wire? It's still the guy. Yeah, one. Uh, same one. Yeah. Still got yeah. This. Looks like he's going to get it. He can flip it over there. Test three is there. Test two? Test two. I don't know whether this is true. Yeah, or well maybe you can Moving move to the there. other projection. Just yeah. to confirm. Test 
test test it test test that's in the atrial branch leave it yeah. there and put another wire down test test no ready ready no this is not mm -hmm. No. Test. Test. I need more distal. Mm. Okay. I think we, I think it's time to move to the reverse wire. Probably it's more easy to select the austere LCX. Test. This is a very experienced team working here, but I think for those of you in the audience, you should think that it's, it's there's you sh shouldn't get frustrated. You should have a plan, but don't get impatient because things are not going particularly well. Have a have a plan. There's a. a I, particularly with a live case and they're running out of time, I, I don't think they'll fall into this trap, but there is a trap to just hurry on and, and that's not the right thing to do here. I think the problem here is not just the reversed angulation, but also the diseased ostium. Yes. And yes, you must right. pass through the stent strut. I think all these add up together. Problem pose. So should should we move to the stiffer wire? It's it's, uh, it's not easy, right? I think the stiffer wire will just make the. Yeah, I mean, you, the wire cannot follow through because of the curve. Once, even though you are in the true Austin. Yeah, you're right. Another problem is that uh, there is uh, some bending at the left main. Yeah. So. The, Test. Test. While they're working, do you want to comment on the, the reverse wire or hairpin technique? How do, you, how do you actually do that? What wires do you prefer? What are the tips and tricks? Oh, well, uh, first of all, for, the, for a situation like this, is, you know, as Paul mentioned, it's not just the issue of uh, you know, whether you got this angulation, retrofast direction, but it's also a matter there's actually a disease at the ostium, probably some calcification together with going through the stand shot. In terms of the reverse wire technique, even if the wire tube can successfully fade and face into the ostium, but then it might actually end up having difficulties in navigating through when you further turn the wire. Therefore, it might not be very applicable in, in that situation. Now, in terms of the technique, of course, you can use those, um, you know, hydrophilic wire, you know, make a reverse turn, like a double turn, you know, hairpin shape, and then with, with the J curve, go through it with the um, crusade capital like this, gradually pull it back until the loop actually facing uh, in uh, the, 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 and also the, the, the end tube actually facing into the ostium. Therefore, you can navigate. But it's not that easy sometimes. Even with a, a non-disease ostium, you may encounter difficulties. Ready? And you have Ready? to reverse the direction of, of turning the capital. So, so it's actually a very challenging operational issue as well. Okay, there is some gap between the, the previous stand ostium and the circumplex ostium. So I like to stand first the left main and then try to, the, if there is some jail, 
so complex and try to again. Could you show, could you show us the RAO? What is the left LED side? Three point five. What is the length? Twenty four, please. Twenty. Is twenty six. What is the shorter one? Twenty two. 까지 나올 필요 없거든요. 네, twenty two. 메인 옷은 안안 덮어도 되거든. Twenty two 주십시오. Three point five. Twenty two. Let's see the, uh, the, the fate of a circumflex ostium. <coughs> I know this is a little bit risky, but uh, take time. Dr. Ellis, this is a really challenging case, but uh, uh, if you uh, have successfully introduced the wire into the circumflex, what's your next strategy to yes, treat I know. this reason? Yes, yeah. I think if you think the circumflex is big enough to go after, which I think the operators feel it is, I think you would uh, ideally, you could either tap, or I'd actually consider a, a, like a mini culotte with a stent into the circumflex and then stent back from the LED to the left main. Getting a stent in there is not going to be too much fun, though, for the same reasons I can't wire. Could you show us the was again? Okay, Ron, please. Could you measure the exactly length from the previous stand and left main? You know, some people may argue that uh, you can treat this patient uh, after standing to the left main and LED and uh, medically treat for the second for as a single vessel disease. Well, that's right, and the circumflex is the smallest of, of her three vessels, isn't it? So, I mean, that may be uh, done out of necessity, but it might mm -hmm. work quite well. Can I see the bust, stem buster? Based on my first size, I saw the many classification. Do you think this, we need more lesion preparation before putting a stem limit to the LED? So that's a really good question. So who on the panel would like to take that? Is it they need to prepare the left main more, or is it okay? Do you mean left main stenting or what? I'm sorry. I think the question was the left main has calcium. Is it okay just to go ahead and, and place the stent now or, yes. or should they prepare? prepare it better? Yeah, prepare better. I think he did some hypergeal dilatation on the left main. Did he not? Yeah. But I think it needs more. Two 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 calcium is very, very thick, so I think. For me, my opinion says I, I need more lesion preparation before I put a stand there. Hmm. I think the question is also they have somewhat limited tools, not to be uh, yeah, pejorative in any way, but it's a big vessel, so how are you going to, would you just, I think the options are to cut it. You don't have up hmm. some of the other options we might have elsewhere in the world. Well, elsewhere in the world, it's not. Maybe 5% of places in the world have this, so it's not like everybody has it. But, there's, this lady is stable Ready? right now, and I, I just don't see a reason to continue because you don't have a, a definitive. Um, putting in a second stand in the left main is just redoing a, the mistake that was made originally and won't make things better. Okay. Inflation. Yeah, I put the t already. Deflation. No, they didn't. Deflation. 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 I tried to minimal overlap, small geographic miss. Uh, mm -hmm. Outside of the left main. Yeah. 
We're having a little right, side, sidebar discussion about the stent in the ostium of the left main. Are you sure that's properly placed? Usually we go cranial to make sure that's in the right sure. spot. Y yes, yes, I, I, I already, uh, I, I fully agree with your opinion, but uh, my focus is uh, just uh, distal overlap. The length is already determined, so the protruding to the aorta is not a problem because uh, I cannot uh, place the more digitally because uh, to make uh, the minimal overlap. No, I, I understand that fully. I, I guess you could change your stent length if you were unhappy with the, the proximal location, but it's a little late right now. So, Ron, please. So, usually, you're uh, very happy to get the uh, AP cranial view, right? Yes, right. So, here is the circumplex. Yeah. My concern is overlapping. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is no gap. So, very minimal overlap. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bach already mentioned that uh, if I success this procedure, patient circumplex is only one vessel disease. So, I can treat them medically. Yeah. So I have to apply high pressure to the left main to avoid the gel to the circumflex. I have to apply the left, shaft, left main shaft and ostium only. Here is the left main ostium. I think a very exact location of the left main yeah. standing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So please give me the four o four. Uh, 3.5 high pressure. Okay. Yes. Fortunately, I already uh, safely performed the 3.0 3 high pressure balloon to the this left main. So, can you measure the here the minimal stain area? Test, please. Okay, here. Long, uh, 14. 14. 16. 18. 18. Left main is more than 4. 20. 20. Depletion. Can you see the minimum stand area at the, this left main? Yes. So here is the uh, stand area is 9. 20, 24. 10, 12, 24. Depletion. 24. OK, I applied the high pressure using the 3.5 up to 24. What is the final balloon size? Final balloon size. 24. Ready? OK. I'd like to check the suck. Yeah. Suck is still, good. Still patent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows the fate of a side branch. So I like to see. I like to see the ivus. So I like to measure the minimum stand area. Minimum stand area, as you know, the, uh, the one of the very important predictor of. Uh, Future instant re stenosis. Okay, from here. No. Small dissection, but uh, I don't think this, it, it, it compromises the radio flow. Here, I applied the 3O from here, this is LHG. Yes. So, very expanded, the way opposed to the vessel wall. The uh, stent size is getting bigger than before. At least uh, uh, 2.75. Here is 3O. Here I apply the high pressure. Using the 3O balloon up to 20.
So here we, where is, uh, Stan is where it's opposed to the vest wall, but some small malaposed area, maybe this is due to the calcification. Yes. In the calcified region, a perfect opposition sometimes is not possible. Here is this left main bifurcation. And left main here. Left main is stand size is good. I implanted 3.5, 18 stand. I applied 3.5 <laughs> up to 20, 24. Here is your left main ostium. Mm. Too strong. Ready? Ready? Even though there is a, uh, I was, uh, on the I was, there is some edge dissection, but uh, the LED flow is uh, TMI3, no visible dissection. So I was uh, defined the small dissection did not uh, affect the patient long-term outcome. So at this moment, I'd like to finish it, my procedure. Yeah, I think that uh, we're running short of time, but you shared with us a very, very challenging mm -hmm. case. I think it takes a certain amount of courage to take on this type of a case in front of a large audience. I think we'll compliment you on your technical skills, and you really have reduced mm -hmm. this, uh, this woman's situation to a single vessel disease yes. in, in a small circumflex. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, to stay on time, let me introduce the next speaker who uh, really needs no introduction. Antonio Colombo is going to talk about, to us uh, about a very apropos topic given what we just saw, uh, calcified lesion PCI. Antonio? Thank you very much, Steve. I think this uh, uh, case uh, really uh, highlights uh, what should not uh, be done from the very beginning, uh, place a stent without adequate lesion preparation. Uh, so it's uh, I really, there are many questions still open about the case we have broadcast, but uh, let's go to the topic. Classified lesion PCI I have nothing to disclose. So the first uh, and uh, the easy approach is high pressure balloon that we always do that. But again, uh, we, it's simple, it's uh, very cost effective, but uh, uh, we should not really be so always in love of this. Uh, rotational laterectomy is really a very important technique, it's old, but we should uh, really have a low threshold. Uh, Angioscalp or cutting balloon is another possibility, and you will see I show cases we are using cutting balloon uh, undersized, uh, and inflated at very high pressure at 20, 22 atmosphere with very good result. Uh, shockwave balloon uh, is not available uh, everywhere, but is certainly an alternative, uh, but has to be really calcified and not fibrotic. Laser with content or without. And I didn't mention here is orbital aterectomy because it's really not... Uh, not available in many countries, uh, but uh, is, uh, is lacking here. Uh, so these are first, uh, we go quickly here. Uh, this lesion doesn't seem to be very severe. Is a, there is a stain, but the lumen area is 3.6, unacceptable. With the OPN high pressure balloon, 40 atmospheres, you get a good result. Um, don't always be enthusiastic because we had some vessel rupture. Uh, so every time you go to 40 atmosphere, you must uh, have in mind that that lesion can be stented with a cover stent. If it cannot be stented with a cover stent, just refrain from doing that. Or if you don't have a cover stent in your lab, that can go there because sooner or later you will break uh, the vessel. It's okay, but it's something that uh, is not okay if you are not prepared for that. Um, I think it's, uh, this was the before. So rotablation, rotablation is something that is so familiar. I don't think uh, 
we need to discuss uh, too much, but this is an interesting case, uh, despite 1.75 rot uh, ablation, which uh, uh, caused the lesion well, there was uh, still incomplete balloon expansion, is not so clear here, but by IVUS uh, was, uh, was still uh, uh, not broken completely. There are some uh, fracture in the calcium, but not, uh, not enough to guarantee good balloon expansion. And uh, uh, an alternative, uh, if a high pressure balloon does not work, uh, is uh, to do high pressure cutting balloon. Uh, for high pressure cutting balloon, I mean cutting balloon at 20 atmosphere. It's not certified, but uh, it works pretty well. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, if you do that, you have to do IVUS and must be sure that you are not oversizing uh, your device. Uh, and also keep in mind that when you're inflating a high pressure cutting balloon, the cutting balloon is uh, semi-compliant, uh, so you have to undersize half a millimeter, otherwise you're gonna use uh, uh, cover stent. And after the cutting balloon, you have an additional broken calcium, and then uh, you can deliver the stent uh, with, uh, with, a good, uh, with a good final result. Uh, why is uh, the cutting balloon effective? I don't think uh, the blade cut the calcium. I never was able to cut a piece of stone with a knife. Uh, but uh, I think the blade gives a more uh, uniform force, uh, and I think it's just a mechanical. Uh, with a high pressure balloon, the force is only in one point, uh, with a blade that uh, uh, is not uh, as uh, uh, adaptive, uh, you have more uniform uh, force uh, and uh, you get a little bit better result. It's not guaranteed, but usually a little bit better. Of course, the other uh, approach is to take a two over. Uh, use of laser, uh, for people that have laser, uh, it's really very effective as long as you stay inside the calcium or if you have a stent under expansion, you stay inside the stent. Uh, I would try first uh, uh, with uh, maximum uh, energy influence and uh, repetition rate, 80-80. Uh, and if it doesn't work, I will try with some uh, uh, contrast or maybe even before contrast just without flashing because, uh, you know, when you do with contrast, uh, uh, it's very effective, but it's very aggressive. So you can end up uh, with a diffuse uh, uh, dissection. This is an instant uh, situation, so that's very uh, predictable because if you stay inside the stent, you are really safe. And it's really very, uh, very effective. Uh, the point uh, is that uh, uh, it's not always available, the laser, and is expensive. I would not use... Uh, uh, the probe bigger than 0.9 because bigger probe gives uh, uh, too many bubbles uh, and uh, the bubbles are CO2 bubbles and give distal embolization which is not really uh, liked by, uh, by the distal bed. But uh, here the balloon expands very well and uh, the result is really great. Uh, so I think this uh, is a possibility. Uh, another possibility is to use a shock wave. Uh, shock wave is not approved for instant uh, restenosis, but I think is another uh, very elegant uh, solution. This is not an instant restenosis; it's a diffuse, uh, calcified uh, lesion of the of the LAD. Uh, you see, by uh, by OCT, there is a lot of uh, a lot of calcium with uh, with a shock wave. Uh, here, you can really obtain a very good result and I would say so far in a very safe uh, uh, situation because uh, uh, we have used it and uh, uh, even from other experience uh, I don't have uh, any mention of vessel rupture so it's most probably a very safe uh, uh, alternative not always uh, uh, usable without predilatation uh, and I would not even be surprised if in some cases you have to do rotational laterectomy and then shock wave uh, to get the balloon there. But uh, if you are willing to do that, uh, you certainly end up with very nice results. There are dissections, but uh, as I always say, uh, dissections are complications only if you don't have stents in your cat labs. So with, cat, with stents, uh, dissection is just good lesion preparation. So this is after 
the shock wave and uh, uh, what I like uh, to show you is not much the calcium rupture but uh, the very uh, final result with uh, OCT you see it's really uh, very but uh, what is nice is to have uh, almost uh, a nice uh, symmetry which is not common to achieve uh, uh, after uh, in a calcified lesion, even with high pressure balloon print dilatation. So I think uh, this nice symmetry may give a more uniform uh, blood flow and a better uh, situation to prevent uh, uh, intimal hyperplasia. Look at the very final, how uh, symmetric, uh, uh, not perfect, but definitely very symmetric, telling you that the calcium has been broken. So optimal lesion preparation is a must, and I believe uh, we own this word to the bioresorbable scaffold. The bioresorbable scaffold has been a, a, a victim of unoptimal lesion preparation, and these uh, devices uh, uh, have the tribute uh, to bringing back uh, this terminology. Rotablator, a laser with contrast, uh, cutting or angioscalp, high pressure, OPN, uh, very high pressure dedicated balloon, a shock wave, and I didn't mention, but certainly orbital atherectomy is in that group. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Colombo. I'd like to introduce the second speaker, uh, Dr. Sp Stephen Ellis from the Cle Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Ellis is going to give us a talk entitled 10 year post DS outcomes in pre diabetics, more akin to diabetics or non diabetics. Dr. Ellis, please. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Well, we thought this issue was particularly important. Uh, for two reasons. First of all, it's now been reported that a number of our patients undergoing DES are pre-diabetics, probably 20 or 30 percent, although we don't always test for this. And at least in societies that are more accepting of bypass surgery, the presence of diabetes is a strong motivator to send patients with multivessel disease for bypass. So then the question arises, are pre-diabetics more like diabetics or non-diabetics? These are my disclosures. And I'll start by trying to put a, a perspective on this. Uh, at least in the United States, the typical patient who receives a DES is 60 years old, and their life expectancy is about 15 years. So maybe we should be thinking a little bit more like surgeons. You know, we've been, I think we're breaking out of this a little bit, but to a certain extent, interventionalists have been held hostage to the idea that restenosis occurs in the first year. So the focus of many studies is one year, and quite honestly, more recently, we've been going out to five years. But from the perspective of our 60-year-old patient, five years really isn't that long. So maybe we should be thinking about longer outcomes. Until recently, we had very limited data about long-term outcomes. There was sort out two and Surtax very late, uh, but both of these really were for first-generation DES and perhaps not terribly helpful. More recently, fortunately, we have longer-term data for second-generation stents, and I'll quote two studies, the first being RESET, which was a randomization of patients between Cypher and Zients. And the point to be made here is after the first year, when we saw the restenosis-related effects, over the long haul, there's a 1% per year target lesion revascularization rate for both stents. And when I look at the slope of that curve, it really looks like the slope is, is not diminishing. It's pretty stable year over year. Uh, we have ISAR test four, we have 10-year outcomes. You'll recall this was a randomized trial between Yukon, Zients, and Cypher. Yukon and Zients tended to do better, but the same message accrues here. We have early events in the first year, and then we have sort of an inexorable 1% uh, per year target lesion revascularization rate. So to summarize then for what we know about second generation DES, some commonalities. In the first year, target lesion failure of about 5%, MACE 10%, stent thrombosis 1%. And then the subsequent annual rate, which appears to be relatively constant, about 2% for target lesion failure, 3 to 4% for MACE, and about 2% or 0.2% for stent thrombosis. But what about subgroups? Do all patients behave the same? And in this talk, I'll be focusing on the pre-diabetics. So we took a, a, a stance here, a research approach that's a little different than what we're seeing 
traditionally now in medicine. In medicine, we are, we're looking at big data. So we have now data on thousands of patients, but sometimes we don't understand the nuances of their characteristics. So we chose to look at a smaller number of patients, but to look very, very carefully at granular data. So this is a report from a single center study. We took consecutive patients from January 2005 through March of 2010. We eliminated, because of uh, just different uh, patient characteristics, patients with prior bypass and patients who received tax assistance, tax assistance obviously being worse. This was prospectively limited to nearby zip codes in the United States where we thought we would have very high quality long-term follow-up uh, and the outcomes are noted here. Uh, we had a core angiographic laboratory that helped us uh, get initial syntax and residual syntax scores. We had detailed data on medications and lab values from one to eight years and we looked at a variety of, of endpoints. So with this background, we're able to do a study where we lost only 1.5% of patients at five years and only 1.9% of patients at 10 years. So quite high quality follow-up. In the entire cohort, we'll get to pre-diabetics in a minute, in the entire cohort, this slide shows freedom from death and freedom from uh, cardiac death. So 29% of our patients died at 10 years. This was unrelated to DES type. I didn't mention about half the patients got Cypher and about half the patients got second generation DES, principally Zions. This is freedom from MACE in the overall cohort. So about 50% of patients had MACE at 10 years. 20% in the first two years and about 4% per year thereafter. And this was unrelated to DES type, although if we had more patients, perhaps we would have seen a difference. Where we did see differences was freedom from target lesion failure at 10 years, second generation stents 16%, first generation stents 27%, and this indeed was statistically different. So the overall conclusions for the, the, the largest group, 30% of patients were dead at 10 years, about half of patients had no cardiac events, only 40% of the cardiac events were related to the DES target site, and the DES type affected principally things like target lesion failure and stent thrombosis and had less impact on the more general outcomes such as cardiac death or MACE. So now we'll talk about the pre-diabetic group. This is a complicated slide, but let me try and walk you through it, highlighting details, bet differences between pre-diabetics and diabetics first. So again, pre-diabetics versus diabetics. First of all, there was a big difference in gender the diabetics were much more likely to be female, the pre-diabetics more likely to be male. There were differences with regard to hemoglobin A1C as you might expect, but for just to paint the picture, the diabetics had a hemoglobin A1C average of 7.7, .7, .7. the pre-diabetics 6.0. There were differences also in terms of renal function. So in the diabetic population, 15% had renal insufficiency, whereas in the pre-diabetic set, it was only 5%. There were differences in baseline syntax scores, as you might imagine. So diabetics had worse syntax scores at baseline, and they also had worse syntax scores uh, at the completion of the procedure. Looking at differences between pre-diabetics and non-diabetics, the pre-diabetics more often presented with acute myocardial infarction, more often were smokers, and had lower ejection fraction. What about long-term data? So here are the mortality data. In red, the non-diabetics. In blue, the pre-diabetics and in yellow or gold, the diabetic population. So you see quite a striking difference here. The diabetics did worse, and the pre-diabetics did pretty much as well as the non-diabetics. When you look at multivariate correction, on the top here we have the correlates of mortality between non-diabetics and pre-diabetics, and you can see that after you look at age, renal insufficiency, smoking, and COPD, which were all statistically significantly related to mortality, that Pre-diabetics did not have a difference in mortality compared to non-diabetics. If you do the same analysis, pre-diabetics versus diabetics on the bottom part here, again, after factoring in age, ejection fraction, residual syntax score, renal insufficiency, baseline hemoglobin, all of which correlated with mortality, pre-diabetics continued to do differently. That is, it continued to do better than diabetics with regard to the outcome of mortality. Here are the data for MACE. The curves look somewhat similar. Again, diabetics doing worse the other two curves overlapping. If you do a similar analysis, um, looking at the differences between non-diabetics and pre-diabetics on top, no difference. And if you look at differences between pre-diabetics and diabetics on the bottom, this remains statistically significant after correction for other cofactors. So to summarize then, for subgroup conclusions in pre-diabetics, 
There appears to be a gradient of comorbidities with diabetics having more comorbidities than pre-diabetics, who in turn have more comorbidities, comorbidities than non-diabetics. But interestingly, in the pre-diabetic population, they seem to have an outcome much more similar to non-diabetics than pre-diabetics. And I think this has some potential ramifications for how we choose revascularization options in these patients. A last comment, uh, when we looked at multiple outcomes, if the initial characteristics that are under at least some physician control, residual syntax score appears to be particularly important. And we need to bear that in mind and shoot for uh, nearly complete revascularization. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Uh, we have uh, several minutes for discussion. Any questions or comments from the panelists? I'd like to ask Dr. Colombo a simple question. Uh, for the uh, interventionist, use of a modified balloon is much more friendly uh, compared with the rotational atherectomy. Do you think the, uh, uh, the strategy of uh, modified balloon, balloon first and uh, crossover to the rotational atherectomy if we failed? What do you think about that strategy? I think uh, it's fine. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I believe uh, we are underutilizing uh, rotational atherectomy. I think uh, our threshold uh, should be lower. Uh, the other point is that uh, uh, we're always afraid uh, to do rotational atherectomy if you have a dissection. I think if you have a big dissection, is uh, is something to be, to be afraid. But if you have a small dissection, it's okay. So I don't think uh, if you have done balloon and you have a small dissection, you should not do rotational laterectomy. It's fine, as long as the dissection is not huge. I have one question. About, uh, I have one question to Professor Colombo. Uh, can you tell me the definition of high pressure balloon dilatation? Uh, you mean, in the uh, live demonstrations, he, uh, Dr. Ern used the 60 atmosphere or something, right? Six zero? Six, no, one six. One six. But uh, you, you showed the case with 40, uh, four zero atmosphere. How do you think about the uh, definition of the high pressure? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you're, uh, thank you for asking this question. <laughs> high pressure balloon inflation is not like pregnancy which is uh, yes or no. Uh, high pressure balloon inflation is the pressure necessary to get a good result without breaking the balloon or the vessel. Dr. Colombo? In the kind of lesions we're talking about, um, if your initial balloon doesn't fill out completely, um, you need to either debulk or use a high pressure balloon or more likely both. And after debulking, for instance, with rotablator, you need to take a balloon that's perhaps a half a millimeter less than what you want to use for a stent, blow it up to whatever pressure is necessary. If that balloon will then fill out, then you have a perfect situation for stenting. If that balloon still has a, a, an imprint on it, then you should uh, do some more debulking. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you should not implant a stent uh, if you are not... Uh, ready, unless you have a dissection, then you have to prevent uh, vessel occlusion, uh, but uh, otherwise you have, to, you have to stop. And uh, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not good uh, to implant a stent without a good lesion preparation. But we have all the devices. And uh, the other point uh, is that uh, if you are really uh, fond uh, of uh, vessel preparation, uh, uh, you have to be prepared to use some cover stents eh? because uh, even in the best setting, sometimes you have a vessel rupture. So uh, I hate vessel rupture, but I think uh, I broke over 100 vessels in my practice. Antonio, in, in many parts of the world, they don't have shockwave, they don't have lasers. So you're really left with two strategies. One is upfront rotational atherectomy. The other is high pressure balloon inflation and then crossing over to rotational atherectomy. Can you give some guidance to the group about what are the, what are the characteristics, either angiographic or otherwise, that would make you go to rotablator first versus the crossover approach? 
But uh, I think, uh, you know, rotablator, I tend to underuse rotablator. Uh, I think it's, it's nothing bad to use it uh, more. The, uh, the characteristics uh, is uh, uh, when the balloon has difficulty to cross, uh, you shouldn't uh, really... I hate to have 1.25 balloons, uh, only to, to exchange wires. Uh, if the balloon, if the 2 balloon does not cross, you should not use a 1.25, you should do rotablation. Uh, if the ivus does not cross, uh, you should do rotablation. And uh, if you think, uh, should I do rotablation, you should do rotablation. So the fact that it comes to your mind, uh, you should do. These are simple rules, uh, but uh, are, are good rules. And uh, I'm eager to try also uh, orbital aterectomy. I think orbital aterectomy is uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, the advantage of orbital aterectomy versus rotablation is that you can uh, do the procedure on the way back. And uh, if you have a very angulated vessel, uh, doing the procedure on the way back may be more advantageous than doing on the way in because you, you avoid, uh, you go for the uh, wire bias in the opposite direction, not uh, towards uh, where you perforate. So I think the perforation rate uh, may be very low if you do it on the way back. The way back you cannot do is rotablation because it's not made for that. So that's an incredibly important point, I think, because the Viper wire is very stiff and will give you tremendous wire bias. And I think if you are, particularly if you're going on a high-speed CSI forward, you run a high risk of perforation, which we've seen in our lab. Yeah, but if you do on the back, and especially with the new wire, the, the old Viper wire that uh, you still have in the United States is really very too, too stiff. But even with the new one, if you do on the way back, I think in angulated segment, you get a real interesting advantage. I think I want to make a comment on rotoblader, which um, we, the way we use rotoblader now is much different than the way we used it in 1990. In 1990, we tried to get as big an opening as we could with the largest, uh, largest um, burr, but um, now there's really no reason to go beyond the 1.5 burr because if you do a good job of debulking with the 1.5 burr, you change the compliance of the vessel and now it should be pretty easy to stent. And you could prove that by using the balloon as we discussed a few minutes ago. If you do rotablation and you have a, a slow flow, wait to place a stent until the slow flow has been completely resolved. The worst, the best way to make the slow flow worse is to place a stent. Yeah. So especially to post dilate with high pressure. Wait because otherwise you're going to kill the patient. Well, maybe we should conclude with those uh, words of wisdom. Clearly, calcified lesions are still a problem for interventionalists. That's where all the focus was in the, in the discussion. Uh, I want to thank the panelists, the discussants. We want to thank the operators. Uh, very, very challenging cases, particularly the second one. Thank the audience. Hope you enjoyed it, the session, and uh, wish you a good rest of the day. Thanks.